doing work. They should have learned by now with COVID that it's better to just hang out and really not do work. But, uh, <laughs> you know, our, our, it seems like our attendance is, is kind of, uh, you know, shrinking over time. And I just don't know if, if uh, you know, people are just busy and kids at home. And, and you know, I'm, there are people that work with me that are in their you know, 40s and 50s and have kids. So all of a sudden you're talking and you hear, you know, some screaming person run behind the desk Yes. And other things yeah. like that. So, yeah, um, I'm pretty shameless. I, I usually send out a mass email. People usually ignore it, but then they some of them come. So, <laughs> um, but yeah, I think people are getting sort of zoomed out too. Um, yeah. Yeah. I mean, there's only so many that you can go to. And I find that doing the readings, I've done a few with my new book, it's, um, you can't get your friends to go that many times, you know. <laughs> so, <Right. laughs> like well, you have a new, you have a new convert, Jeff. Um, I, I uh, was talking about your book to my husband, and he immediately read the whole thing. And he said, "Make sure to tell him that I just loved it." And he said, "Why can't more poetry be like this, where people, a person, is talking directly to another human being about what really matters?" And he just loved it. So I wanted oh, to pass that on. Yeah. No, thank him. Um, you know, uh, I, I don't really know him, but I did meet him in Newburyport a couple of years oh, ago. Oh, that's right. That's right. Just, right. just for a second. So, but yeah. that that's great. So, um, yeah. yeah. And he's, is he a big poetry reader or not? Well, you know, he's always liked poetry, but he hadn't read, uh, you know, all that much before uh, we got together. But now he's a, you know, huge fan, reads it all the time. So, yeah, it's fun. It's, it's also good to, to have um, someone close to me who will tell me the truth, but who is not a poet, right? Yeah, I, I have that too, yeah. Yep. <laughs> well, everyone needs a reality check in life. That's yeah. right, that's yeah. right. So Mary Jo, we're gonna begin. And I, uh, I'm gonna mute myself, and while I'm muting myself, I'm gonna email a few people. Okay, great, great. But, you, but start anyway. Yeah. Okay. You know, another thing I was thinking, John, is um, we did change the usual time, and that could be a factor, too. Yeah. 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 Well, welcome, everyone, to the February 3rd Stockbridge Library Poetry Hour. We're pleased to have Mary Jo Salter here today. She is the author of eight collections of poems, most recently The Survivors, 2017, and a children's book, The Moon Comes Home. Since so I have a two and a half year old grandson, I'm going to have to look at the moon comes home because he has been reading since in utero and he gets a new book and literally he, he consumes it like it's a meal. Mm -hmm. So uh, she has been the editor of Amy Clampett's Collected Poems and Selected Poems. And uh, for those that may be listening to this, the Amy Clampett House is in, is in Lenox, about a mile up, a uh, mile and a half up the road from, from where I am right now. And she is a co-editor of three editions of the North Norton Anthology of Poetry. The sixth edition was published in 2018. And she is going to share uh, some information about the Norton Anthology during her talk. And, and this is what I, I also love. She also wrote the lyrics for composer Fred Hirsch in the song cycle, Looms of Life, The Life of Photographs, 2015. Mary Jo is the Krieger Eisenhower Professor in the Writing Seminars at John Hopkins University. So Mary Jo, uh, welcome. Uh, for those people watching, I'm John Gillespie. I'm the uh, board president of the Stockbridge Library. This was kind of my brainchild to uh, help people uh, find shelter uh, during the pandemic. And I think we're now in week 37. Of, of hosting the poetry hour. So it's, it's a very nice, as I call it, I get to uh, recharge in the poetry wall and then go about my business. So it's a very nice thing. So Mary Jo, the first question, and you know, we talked about it a few minutes ago, the themes of 2020, you know, the pandemic, obviously politics, economic inequality, racial injustice, and now, you know, the January 6th issue at the Capitol you know, the themes have been dramatic. I, I don't even know if that's the right word for them. How have those themes or have they affected your writing? Um, thank you, first of all, John, for uh, introducing me and for inviting me. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, 
by the way, on my screen, I'm seeing you. Are you seeing? Yeah, usually the other people uh, uh, don't have their cameras on. So I, it's usually just you and me. I, mean, I see, but I'm, I'm a little square here right yeah, now. Yeah, you're a square, I'm a square, and everyone else. Is okay, great. Time. Okay. Anyway, um, uh, yes, I think one of the things that's really very different about writing poetry and writing, say, editorials is that generally speaking, poets process uh, political and social events a little bit longer. And that doesn't mean that we're any wiser, but it, it, it's partly because of the kinds of attention that language pays um, to, uh, to, to po political things. But it's also, uh, it's just that we learn over and over again, I learn over and over again, that if, if I reread a politically current poem 30 years later, it's lost a lot of its punch. Um, a, a lot of um, Vietnam era poetry seemed really urgent at the time, um, but only some of it has survived as important poetry. And so I'm always aware of that, that the references I might make to an event might seem either obscure or so much handled in, the, in other media that what do I have to offer? On the other hand, um, some poets, some poetry um, that has done this is just immortal. And, um, and I'll think uh, in, in the 20th century, think of Auden's poem, September 1st, 1939, which he wrote on the invasion of Poland, but he doesn't actually say that. He talks about um, a low dishonest decade that, that he feels that the 30s were. And when you may, some some people listening may remember that when 9/11 happened, people took out September 1st, 1939, mm -hmm. that poem, and began sending it, it to their friends. And so, political events have their own currency, but they also have currency later if if we write about them well. Um, so, in a short answer to your question is, I have written a lot uh, in the last year about the, in which the pandemic is somewhere in the background. Or, um, or movements, uh, particularly the Black Lives Matter movement, though I don't explicitly call it that, I refer to fists raised in the streets. Um, but uh, I'm sure that, that good poems are gonna be written about this insurrection on January 6th. I just, I haven't tried to write one yet, but somebody's gonna do it and there are gonna be good ones. So, we, we always like to have a, a short amount of time just to understand your creative process. So how does a, how does a poem begin for you? Is there one way or is there a variety of, of things that could trigger the start of, of a poem? I would say there are two primary ways. One is an image. And one of the poems I'll read this afternoon is one in which there is a mountain in the background and in the foreground, some people are eating ice cream cones. And I'm, I'm looking at this scene and I'm thinking of the mountain shaped like this and the snow on top of it and the, the ice cream cone shaped like this and the, the snow, so to speak, on top of it. And that's the beginning and I don't even quite know what I wanna say. Um, um, but it gets fused with other things that I very much want to say. And I'll, I'll say more about that when I read that one. Um, the other way that poems come to me is with um, some conjunction of words that I like together. That they may, they may be a rhyme, but they need not be a rhyme. So for example, I have not used this pairing um, yet, but the other day I wrote down a thought that I'd like to put the word compliant and the word complaint next to each other. They're anagrams and they're kind of opposites, right? You're, you, if you complain, you are not compliant. And, and you know, and one is and 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 one is a noun and one is an adjective, etc. So I would say, yeah, it's it's making little changes on language that get me started. And the other is some something that not necessarily visually reminds me of another thing, but um, some kind of image that strikes me and that I want to kind of know the meaning of. 
Yeah, that's great. That's great. So, you know, what I've learned, I feel like, um, you know, this is like after the summer. What'd you learn in the summer? What'd you do in the summer? So, you know, what I've learned about, about poems ending is they never really end. But if they do have to end and appear in a book, how do you, how do you know when a poem is complete for you? Um, that's a really good question. And it depends. Um, one way I try to know is by putting the poem aside after I think I've finished it. Um, so there are two kinds of finish here, right? One is you're, what you're talking about is, you know, you can keep revising and revising and you might not end your, you might not change your last line, but you, can, you are trying to finish the poem in the sense of making it polished. And the other way of course of ending is what is my ending? What is the last thing I say? And lots of poets have had the, or all kinds of writers, I think have had the experience of believing that they know that they're moving towards a particular ending. And when they get there, they realize that that actually should have been the first thing they said or in the middle or taken mm -hmm. out altogether. So I think it's useful to have an ending in mind when it happens, but yeah. I don't feel compelled to know. And um, but the best way to know is both to set it aside and not think about it so you're a little less married to it when you come back. And the other is to show it to a trusted reader and that reader need not be another poet, but somebody who you don't give any intro to, you don't explain anything. And you just say, what do you think of this? Yeah, great. No, fantastic. No, this is really, really great to, to understand the, the creative process. So why don't you uh, share your readings uh, today? Okay, thank you. Um, well, I thought I would start with parts of a poem uh, that I believe will be the title poem of my next book. Um, I'm calling it Zoom Rooms. And the poem, uh, I thought it's appropriate for today. Um, the poem is a series of sonnets um, that looks at the, the experience of being a virtual person and not feeling quite sure that you exist, and then adapting conventions of technology that become sort of part of who you are. So because I'm reading from the middle of the poem, I'm, I'm just giving that, that um, heads up. And I, I don't, I'm not completely exhaustive about all the kinds of Zoom rooms we live in. I do have, for example, a, few, a, a memorial service in there. Sadly, I've already been to two Zoom memorial service, uh, services, um, but two that um, I think poets often are in. <laughs> one is the classroom and one is the family gathering. In the last year, I became a grandmother and um, I have seen my grandchild in person a couple of times, but um, how we mo mostly know each other is on the screen. So the first, first one of these sonnets from Zoom Rooms is, going, is, um, is a classroom setting, and the second one is meeting with my grandchild. Okay. Here, as professor, I am host, enable the waiting room, and one by one admit my students etherized around a table in the platonic classroom where they sit or recline in bed. Protest this, I don't dare. Full roster, nobody's ill. Smile and wave hello, a new habit. Um, sorry, <laughs> smile and wave hello, a new habit. Can you hear me? Share screen, clicking a doc I thought to save to desktop on my laptop. This is normal. Mixed metaphors and no term we have chosen ourselves. Whether our verse was free or formal, we thought we were free thinkers. Oops, you're frozen, we're bound to say. We sign on for more jargon. Paste in the password, try to join again. And here's one more sonnet from Zoom Rooms. The baby has been brought up in a bubble. <coughs> Outside people. She's generation C for coronavirus. Naturally, somebody clever already came up with that label to spread like another germ. Okay, boomer is what I am. And on a whim or weekends, 
her mother, my millennial offspring, sends an invitation. Am I in the room or am I not? To find out, Lena leans forward to try to taste my virtual head and failing at that, lifts a light bulb screwing sort of wave, a wrist twist like a queen's. Real life at a social distance, almost dead. What on earth can she think we think we're doing? So there are seven of those. And um, as I say, I think that will probably be the title poem of my next book. Um, so I thought what I might do is read and we'll see how long this goes. We can we can turn to more questions when, when you when you would like. But I thought and I would try Mary to Joe, make sure you talk, you know, sometime just about the Norton anthology. I know you probably wrote that down. You know, just some before we end up. Yeah. Um, well, you know, since you're interested in that, why don't I say a bit about that and then I'll read some other poems. Yeah. Um, so my my history with the Norton anthology is this. It was 1992. I was a, a college professor at uh, Mount Holyoke College, and I got a letter from an editor at W.W. W. Norton saying, would you be one of the professors who gives us feedback on our current issue? We're many years behind edit, you know, um, uh, revamping this. And, I don't know, at that point, the, the book, had, the previous edition had been out for 15 years or something, and most of the editors had died. This was a concern of mine. I thought maybe this will kill me. But in any case, um, uh, so they said, would you adv advise us on what you think is good and what might need to be changed? So I wrote, being good student that I am, I wrote a rather long memo. And they came back to me and said, would you like to, no, would you like to edit the Norton Anthology? So um, it turned out that I knew one of the two other editors, but he didn't know I had been asked. Uh, and his name is John Stallworthy. He's now long, no longer with us, but a professor at Oxford and a wonderful poet. And then the third person was Margaret Ferguson, who was then a professor at Columbia and now is it UC Davis. Anyway, how this works is the editors at the Norton or at any university, hi Karen. <laughs> um, uh, the editors um, are each given a certain number of pages and um, uh, we three editors were given a certain number of pages and, and territory. So my territory was about 700 pages and American and Canadian poetry. Um, and I, what I had received in the early 90s was a poem that was about 95% male, um, had almost no black authors, uh, had very, really very little contemporary. Well, of course, that's partly because it was an old book. Um, so there were those factors, but then there were just favorite poems of mine that, favorite poems that I like by others that weren't in there. So I said, you know, I'll start working on this. Well, it turns out in order to write, to edit a book that's 2000 pages, um, you really have to engage in horse trading. So if, you're, if your colleague has 700 pages, and that colleague wants to add two more sonnets by Milton, they're going to strategize. They're going to say, could you please take out those two sonnets by somebody that was written in 1990? And, and how can I not take those out? Of course, Milton is great, and we should always have Milton. So the, the conflicts, there were con conflicts of values. The, the, you know, the desire to have continuity to show what the foundations of verse are at the, in, in English. And by the way, we decided not to publish anything in translation. So that eliminated a tremendous amount. It, that was great, but not written in English. Um, even by people who later became Americans like Joseph Brodsky. Um, and basically you just had to hold on to the, the idea that contemporary readers want examples of modern and contemporary poetry, regardless of the fact that they know that Milton is better than we are. So that was one of the factors. And so what people are always shocked by 
uh, in, in when I've talked to them about the making of this book is that one person's in California. I'm in Mass. I was in Massachusetts, and another is in England. And this is just at the dawn. This is this, this is pre-email for most people, let alone Zoom. And so this is all done by fax. And we had one in-person meeting in three years. And that was that. We did it all by fax and phone. And I don't know how we did that. So the second time I did it was uh, the beginning of the 2000s. And the third time was from 2015 to 2018. <laughs> and of course, the technology got easier, looking up stuff to write right footnotes got easier but i'll tell you what never got easier is all of the living poets i admire who i couldn't put in that book and it, it just it it eats at me you know and what you're doing is you're giving kind of representative kinds of poems being written during any period but we also had a rule that we we made up one is that the editors don't appear in the book two is that um, we don't print anyone who, who hasn't written more than one poem that we love. So that sort of took Francis Scott Key out of there, you know, and, and, but that also means that certain people who wrote fabulous poems um, weren't in there. And we made a few exceptions, but in general, it, the idea was that you would be choosing from someone, choosing people who had, you know, a, a great body of work that you know, you could only choose some of. So I don't know if we've gone on too long or wh whether anyone has questions about that. I can't hear you, John. Yeah, and I just thought it was an important thing to, to talk about just because you've been involved three times. So no, no, thanks for sharing that. And sorry for the, uh, the Norton Anthology interruption and you can go back with your great readings. Okay, thank you. Um, so I thought I began the reading for those who just joined with a, a poem about being on Zoom. And now I thought the rest of the, of the reading, I would read poems about all the things that we used to be able to do before the pandemic, which means basically everything in life. Um, so um, I'm, I'm going to start with a poem called The Hotel Belvedere. And uh, I mentioned it early in the hour because John was asking about, you know, how do you get ideas? And this really began with the idea of a mountain in front of me. Uh, this is set in Switzerland. So the thing we used to be able to do is travel. And um, we're sta we are standing in front of uh, a, a famous mountain in the Swiss Alps, the Jungfrau. Okay, the Hotel Belvedere. A June day under the Jungfrau Near the railway that brought her here, an old woman sits on a bench. She isn't facing the Jungfrau, but the Hotel Belvedere, which has, as its name implies, a beautiful view of the Jungfrau, a name for what she had been when she last saw it, maybe, on her honeymoon. She regards the hotel intently, studies what I assume were the windows of their room. Was it hard to come back alone hobbling on that cane? No, not alone. Her husband and daughter or granddaughter, surely this couple's offspring can't be very young, have arrived with ice cream cones, inverted mountains where snow is piled on the widest end. They make the most of that pleasure before, like a magic trick, a tripod's pulled from a backpack. Steady as you go, is what the granddaughter says as she pulls the old woman up and the three of them, like a tripod, lean to make one shape that peaks on top like the Jungfrau. But the hotel's the backdrop. The camera is timed to snap at a smile and another smile. New pose and it snaps again. Even the staring stranger who has no need to invent their story is distracted from the majesty of the Jungfrau and heeding gestures meant to yield up little grandeur. The acts of a granddaughter who, when she's old, will tell of the long journey they took back to the hotel, the origin of what mattered to a few vanished people. There was ice cream 
and a view of the snow-capped Jungfrau, which is nowhere pictured. Okay, one other um, travel poem. Uh, this one is set in Slovenia, and probably the only thing that most of us know about, um, no, I'm sorry, Slo Slovakia, sorry. <laughs> I was just about to make a major mistake. But anyway, Slovakia, and I wouldn't have intended necessarily to go to Slovakia, but I was in Austria and we got on a train and we went and got ourselves confused in various ways. Uh, also, this poem is set in a time of great transition in my, my life, which you will hear. Uh, what else should I tell you? It, 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 um, it's written in occasional rhyme, not usually, and uh, in, in couplets. It's called Bratislava. So I'm still alive, and now I'm in Bratislava. That's funny. I hadn't expected to be alive. A sign in italics nudges us at the station. Have an amazing time in Bratislava. That's funny. A straight-faced wish offered in English and then Slovakian, posted above a trash can that stands like the only monument in town. We've heard there's a castle, though. We need a tram. We take one, and it heads in the wrong direction. A pretty girl, cheerful and blonde, straightens us out, and we get, an, we get on and off a bus at the proper stops. That's funny. Already a right place and a wrong one to be in Bratislava. And I am among the people who sort of get this, at least at the moment I happen to occupy within a vacation in Vienna with a day trip to Bratislava. That's funny. I'd assumed my travel companion through life would be my husband, even if I'd gone to Bratislava, which I hadn't thought of long enough to think I would or wouldn't. The spanking white castle standing high on a hill, we climb on foot, swigging our bottles of Coke. Dates to the year 800 or so, but burned down to the ground, which tends, as we know, to happen, and was reconceived in one of the worst times of all, the 1950s under Soviet rule. That's funny. Atop of embarrassing pillars, knights in plaster armor gaze up at the sky triumphantly, although what for is forgotten. And the sunlight they eclipse in silhouette is all the sillier on those phallic cannons between their legs with three or four cannonballs. More cannonballs per man. That's human history in a nutshell. Bullies unsated with all they've got and below the blindsided masses. That's what it is. And yet I'm happy now with my companion. He likes me, I like him. He has his own backstory of bleak encampments, battles lost, and sorrows best not spoken of in Bratislava, lest we spoil our day, which so far is duly amazing. I admire his dignity. Dignity is funny. Everything's funny now, which we hadn't expected to happen, either of us, after what happened. We're still alive, and now we're in Bratislava. Okay, one more that is both travel and another thing that we uh, have lost during the pandemic, which is going to movies. So this, you all remember, of course, uh, in Casablanca, when Humphrey Bogart turns to Ingrid Bergman and says, we'll always have Paris. So I've got a hearing problem. I'm always mishearing. And I even mishear things that I already know. And so somebody said, we'll always have Paris as a reference to this movie. And I misheard it as, we'll always have parents. And I thought, yeah, that's really true. You know, so that's what this poem is called. We'll always have parents. It isn't what he said in Casablanca and it isn't strictly true. Nonetheless, we'll always have them much as we have Paris. They're in our baggage or perhaps our baggage of the old fashioned type before the wheels, which we remember when we pack for Paris or don't remember. Paris doesn't know if you're thinking of it Neither do your parents, although they say you ought to visit more, as if they were as interesting as Paris. 
Both Paris and your parents are as dead and as alive as what's inside your head. Meanwhile, those lovers, younger every year, because with every rerun, we get older, persuade us less for all their cigarettes and shining unshed tears about the joy of Paris blurring in their rearview mirror, that they've surpassed us in sophistication. Granted, they were born before our parents, but don't they seem by now, Bogart and Bergman, like our own children? Think how we could help. We could ban their late nights, keep them home the whole time, and prevent their ill-starred romance. Here's looking at us, kid. You'll thank your parents. Well, as a... Uh, as you heard in the Bratislava poem, um, there was reference to a new relationship and I am now married to that man. And um, there's a lot we've had to catch up about in each other's lives. Um, so I wanted to read the next poem for that reason and also because it's another thing that we can't do during the pandemic that I want to celebrate in memory, which is sports. So this poem is called tennis in the snow, and it's a dialogue between the two of us. You looked up from your book, and apropos of nothing, asked, did I ever tell you I played tennis once in the snow? No, I said, you didn't. Where is this? Tennis in the snow, you said again. It was in Colorado. No, in Kansas. I was a young captain. Did you win? I don't know. I'd play this guy at the base, Marty. I can see us laughing, slipping and sliding all over the place. Were tennis balls still white back then? A smile from you. No, they were yellow already. This was the late 80s. It wasn't all that long ago. Oh, I said, that's a shame. I'm picturing the big white flakes whirling around, and part of the game was that you guys could hardly tell the difference between falling snow and the big white fuzzy tennis ball, or even the full moon that would seem to lob over your heads that night, like a movie or a dream. It was daytime, you said. Nice story, though. Sorry, I said. I should leave it there. I just wanted to be mixed up in it the place where your memories are. Uh, how are we doing for time? Um, let's see, I think I'll skip ahead to, um, another thing we don't do is go to reunions. Yeah, it's 12.35, so you have plenty of time. Okay. This poem um, is based on my own high school reunion. Um, I guess it was my, I don't know what it was, but anyway, it was far, far along. Um, and uh, this poem, you know, just because you can't see it, it's again written in a style I often, I, I, I often do that where um, I'm writing in off rhyme, and I'm also writing. Hello. Oh. Um, uh, writing in off rhyme, and also um, usually a pattern of line one and line three of, of three line stanzas, but there are exceptions. Um, and I don't think, I think we've all been to reunions, so nothing more to say really. It's called Today's Specials. Why did I come tonight? Too late. I've handed my keys to some boy valet, polite to the point of insolence. He's so young, I'm so old. Really, why take offense or even take the time, the precious time, to reflect that I was once like him, appalled at the parade of the hairsprayed and the bald? I tip him, scan the crowd, and advance toward the cliques of nerds, cheerleaders, potheads, jocks, and Jesus freaks I'd felt awkward with, and 40 years on, at last, are peers. Yes, this is my party. It's mid-June and bright tents are erected to shield our kind against the elements, which hardly could be milder. A faint breeze stirs the scents of sunscreen, crab cakes, beer, cut grass, and, and gasoline. I think I'll get a drink, 
I begin to cross the lawn, ducking that duck guy I dated once or twice. And did he see me? Do I seem dated? And spot beside the wine bar, a whiteboard with today's specials in black marker. Why do I trust my eyes? I can't read at this distance. I'm nearer now and surprise, here's what it really says in memoriam. What genius arranged for this? How thoughtful and horrible. Different hands have come as they once did in school to diagram the sentence of those who left us first. More like taking attendance, names, dates, an excuse for absence when it's known, cancer, accident. Who's that? Bob Rogers? Bob, my funny uncle-faced pal, pride of the drama club, who tended to t land the role of banker or judge because he had a middle-aged middle, dead at 37. He probably looked the same as he had at 17, while most of us lived to stare for decades at the stage makeup in the mirror that gave back our true age. Bob Rogers, I played your kid. Our names met on a page in playbills kept a while, tossed away, just as I turn now from the other special names for today and scout for anyone to talk with to drive the wisdom out. Well, I wanted to say a few things about what endures despite the conditions that we're in and and Obviously, one of them is love, and I, I wanted to read a few poems, a few more poems about love. Um, this is the other book. Um, this is a poem for my late mother-in-law, and who has who was a very literary person, very verbal person, and began to lose her words. So the poem is called, It's Hard to Say. That's what you say a hundred times a day. Yet we keep asking, how was your morning? Did you like the nurse? The worse you get, the louder we keep asking. As though if you heard better, you could say. Two adjectives bob up sometimes, depending. Good things you call amazing. How was the garden? Did you like the birds? Things are either terrible or amazing. Nothing is in the middle. It's the ending, the drawn out ending of your verbal life. It's hard to say, you say, as though by thinking you'd remember your sentence, word by word, still less to say. This man here is your son. I am his wife. And it is indeed terrible and amazing, you must be told again. I know you though. That undimmed politesse of 80 plus years when awestruck again by a too brilliant question, you sit there gazing thoughtfully into space and only then do you say the terrible thing. It's hard to say. Um, one more love poem, romantic love poem as opposed to family love poem. This again was a courtship poem um, with my second husband. It's called Mr. Boyfriend. New lover, known and unknown. You've risen before dawn and delicious in suit and tie. You lean down to the bed to kiss my rumpled head, the tenderest goodbye. A military bearing adheres to what you're wearing. Oh, how many years did I wait to know a man who knows he is a man and not a boy, who steers himself through the long day and rides it, come what may, in a waft of aftershave and the bracing scratchy starch of his dress shirt. As you march off to the office, brave and clear-eyed in your tortoise shell glasses, looking gorgeous, I feel both safe and weak, slipping back to your kiss in my sleep and the light grays of your cufflink on my cheek. 
And I'll end um, leaving time for question, any more questions with a newer poem, unpublished poem. Um, and this is finally what I'm taking comfort in during this pandemic, which is the natural world. And you know, we've all we've all taken a lot more walks. Um, and uh, but also, I happen to I live in Baltimore, but I. I'm on a little cul-de-sac of a street that is surrounded by trees and you wouldn't know you're in a city, which I feel very fortunate about. And there's several dogwoods and this is the one that I see out my window. So my bedroom window. So this is called White Petals, 3 a.m. Lights out, but it's glowing. The dogwoods white petaled cloud that fills the window above the window seat, just feet from the foot of my bed. And I'm thinking I've seen this, the same wide-eyed whiteness, winter nights, when the naked branches were gloved in snow that had stored the day's light somehow. Now it's the moon, an assumed one, out of the window's frame, spilling light on the constellations of blossoms, beamed through the room to interrogate me. Should people sleep in April? The flowering out there should be my lit up circuitry, my brain reflecting on bounty. This, the moon of conscious fullness, the brimming thing that wanes. The tree with every fragile petal on, before the first one falls, the sun comes up, the green leaves take over the length of summer. So long you forget you live in time. Don't blink, don't, not again. Okay, I'll stop there. And if you'd like me to read more, I can. But if you have questions, that's fine too. No, I think if people, uh, if people could un unmute themselves and and uh, have some questions or comments. Um, well, I have a comment. It's just great to see you, Mary Jo. Wonderful to see you, Karen. And it's great to hear. I know a lot of those poems, and I love hearing you read them. It's wonderful. Thank you. And it's great to see Jess and Jeff, who are good friends. So it's a delightful thing during this it's pandemic. It's a party. <laughs> yeah, it's great. And, and Karen, uh, you know, thank you to you. I think you were one of the first ones I reached out to when we kicked off this poetry hour at the Stockbridge Library. And I think you said to me, you should just get in touch with Dora Malik. That's how the whole snow, snowball started rolling downhill of having poets uh, read at the library. So thank you again for- That's great. I actually, they're normally later and it's a time I can never come. So yeah. I was very happy to see I could do this. Yeah, we do record them. They're on YouTube now. If you uh, go to the library or you can email me, you can get a copy of the recording. And yeah, we, we were doing this to accommodate Mary Jo's schedule. Um, and, uh, but no, fantastic, fantastic reading. Wonderful. Anyone else have questions or, I know Jessica, you had a lot of great comments. <laughs> I just <laughs> so loved the poems. I so completely loved the whole reading and being with those other wonderful poets, but, um, Mary Jo, I just loved the poems. And um, there, there was that kind of invisible structure going on that was bringing the words back. And I was so enjoying that um, along with the rhymes and the wit and the vision. So, and how fantastic Jeff told me about the reading and I'm, what a great, you know, what a great, what a great nuclear part of my day. Just fantastic. <laughs> I, I was, I'm really pleased. Thank you so much for saying that. Yeah. Um, well, you know, it, it is old home week. I feel like I, I know half the people here and it's, it, it feels really good, especially when we can't see people in person. And, um, but um, I don't know, um, I, I'll tell you what I am doing and why we re rescheduled is that um, I, I know you usually have these at three o'clock as I, at 1.30, I start teaching a class called line and lineage. It's my first time teaching it. Dora Malik actually invented it, which was a kind of hybrid of a, a English poetry survey course and a creative writing workshop. And so every week they read um, different poems from 
the, the entire history of English and try their hand at it. So starting at 1.30, we're going to be looking at their Anglo-Saxon alliterative verse that they wrote themselves, which is, I, I read what they did and it was, it turns out you can use that form and write about modern life mm. um, perfect, perfectly well. Richard Wilbur is the only poet I can think of mm. who is often anthologized having done that. The, the, a poem called Junk, which is in the Norton Anthology and many other places. And um, we have a tendency to think that if we over alliterate that it's over alliteration. Um, but if, if you make it clear that that is actually what you want to be doing as opposed to that you stumbled into it and you suddenly realize that you had four S sounds in one line when none of the other lines were doing that. Um, but if you make it a, a structure like anything else, like a rhyme scheme or anything else, it can be, it can not only be successful, but it doesn't need to be humorous. Um, although it could be because we're just so aware that there's so many things that people used to do in their poems that we don't do now. Um, so that's what we're doing today, starting at 1.30. Awesome. Um, I have Raffin a tiny question. Yeah. Um, I mean, I love the reading, so this is gonna seem silly to ask such a small question, but Uncle Faced, did that come right to you or did, or did <laughs> that come later, like while you were revising? Um, I guess it came at the time, but you know, it's funny, things sort of sit in your head. And when, when I learned that this man had died, I, I remember thinking as, as a high school student, not uncle face, but you know, he looks old enough to be my uncle. And so that just, you know, uh, but so many, as you know, I mean, so many things we, we come up with or think we have come up with have in some ways have been in, in your life and in your head forever. And um, so, yes, that's, that's sort of, that's sort of how that happened. Thank you so much. I really, really enjoyed the reading. And I just, uh, I wanted to say about the, the uh, Anglo-Saxon stuff that actually, I think there are a lot of similarities with rap and spoken word. Yes. You know, multiple varying numbers of syllables, lots of alliteration, uh, you know, pride about alliteration. Um, the That's a really good point. Similar. I mean, yeah, as you're saying, they're doing all that. And in addition, there's also the rhyme at the end, right? right. So that it's sort of a marrying of Anglo-Saxon and a, a later, um, uh, um, leaning on on rhyme. That's a really good point. It makes me feel, I, I'm going to mention that in class. I'm going to give you credit though. <laughs> I can't hear you, John. John, you're muted. There. Yeah, my dog uh, likes to sit up here in, in my office over the garage. And if anyone comes down the street in a car, there's some kind of screaming fit. So at a very high decibel level. So that's why I muted and <laughs> ran downstairs to let her out. So uh, <laughs> that's why I was muted. Anybody else have any, any questions or comments? Wendy, great to see you. Nice Haven't to seen see you. Haven't seen you in a while. Yeah, Mary Jo, I, I always tell the story. I think, I think Wendy was one of, Wendy was probably my scariest reader because she said, I'm gonna read all these poems about my family and there were four or five family <laughs> members on the Zoom call. So I felt like maybe I could just back away from the scene when the, when the explosion. Right. I survived. I love the repetition of uh, It's Funny in that, uh, I think it was the first poem you read. Um, it really, the whole meaning of It's Funny began changing throughout the poem. I, I really enjoyed that. You know, the poem seems so conversational, but there's so much more you know, so, so much um, deeper in them. And I really admire that, you know, you sort of feel like someone's just talking to you casually, but it's not casual at all. It's really very studied. I love that. Thank you. Yeah, I, I, I think, you know, this is our mission, those of us who are poets, is to convince people that they don't hate poetry. <laughs> and, and one way is to actually talk to people, you know, as naturally as you can, but you're right. That is, that is the challenge is to sort of have some kind of shape to it. And at the same time, sound like a person. Yeah. 
Um, I just answer that we do record it. Uh, it's on YouTube. Uh, Lloyd just asked me about that. So uh, I put my email address in there. If you want to get a copy of, of the recording, it'll come up in a day or less than a day. I also want to let people know that uh, we do have a bunch of open, open slots in March for, for poets to read. If you're interested in reading, I think we have one person maybe on March 3rd, but then the 10th, 17th, 24th, and 31st. We have four open dates in March. And we're, we're, uh, we're thinking of something a little bit different for Poetry Month. So uh, we're, we're kind of working behind the scenes to uh, for, for Poetry Month to make it a little different. So. Anybody else have any uh, questions or comments? Uh, Shirley, I know you're there. You're muted. You've been on for the whole time. Uh, well, I really appreciate everybody giving their lunch hour to this, and it was really nice to see you all and and to and to commune with with poetry through poetry. So thank you, everybody. It was no, wonderful. It was just thank great. It was great. Yeah, very good. Very good. Wonderful. Wonderful to see you. Great to see you too. All right. We Take care. Off then. Take care. Bye, everybody. Bye. Thanks. All right. Bye. Bye.